So the eighth lecture is looking at indoor environmental quality. So this category is related to occupant health and comfort. So it's looking at air quality, it's looking at ventilation, it's looking at thermal comfort, access to daylight, views, acoustic designs, basically anything that increases the quality of the indoor environment um, and uh, uh, occupant health and well-being. So that again translates into um, nine credits with two prerequisites to give you 16 points. There are four things that look, one prerequisite and three credits that are looked at at the construction phase or need to be evidence in the construction phase. And a lot of this stuff relates to just basically anything that would affect people and the quality of the air, essentially, and health kind of characteristics. The baseline indoor air quality is set using ASHRAE standards and some SIBC standards as well. Um, and basically you would get credits if you attain a design case building that is performing better than the baseline. So it's exceeding the baseline case that's established by the ASHRAE etc standards. The first prerequisite um, looks at the minimum performance and there's two requirements. Um, and you need to, to establish these minimum standards, first of all, and the requirements that reply to both the ventilation and the monitoring of the building. So with the ventilation, whether it's mechanically or naturally ventilated, there's different ASHRAE standards that need to be met. And you have to meet those minimum requirements and there's minimum requirements and they're specified in the ASHRAE and the CN standards for mechanically ventilated and a whole host of ASHRAE standards there if it's naturally ventilated. Um, this also applies to mixed mode systems, so mechanically ventilated when the mechanical ventilation is activated and naturally ventilated for when it's deactivated. So if you do have a mixed mode system, both of these will still um, both of these will actually apply. The second part of the prerequisite is on the monitoring end and this is related then to the construction phase. So if it's mechanically ventilated and you have a variable air volume system, then you need to provide a direct outflow, outdoor airflow measurement device capable of me measuring particular flows with particular accuracies. And if you have a constant volume system, you need to balance the outdoor to the outdoor airflow to the design minimum. And again, it is specified in the ASHRAE standard given or a higher uh, airflow rate or you install a current transducer and, and supply fan. So if you have naturally ventilated then you need to do one of these options. You need to provide a direct exhaust airflow measurement device or you need to provide an automatic indication device on the openings or you need to monitor the CO2. So basically this whole this whole monitoring bit whether it's mechanically ventilated, naturally ventilated or a mixed mode system. The same thing applies when one is activated or deactivated in a mixed mode, you'd need to apply these. It's basically looking at sensors and monitoring of the performance of that system. And that's the second part to this prerequisite. So um, this is about avoiding tobacco smoke in buildings. This is supposed a departure from the 2009 that actually did allow smoking in commercial buildings if the room is separately ventilated. So LEED version 4 is the first version that actually prohibits smoking inside non-residential buildings. There's a different um, requirement for residential and that's given in the manu manual. Um, so this basically you need to outdoors, you need to prohibit smoking outside except in a designated area and that area has to be at least 25 feet from the entries or air intakes or operable windows um, in all areas used for business purposes and you have to include no smoking signage within 10 feet of all entrances. And then when you're indoors, there's no smoking in non-residential and you need to either follow the same prerequisite for residential or you need to implement significant measures to minimise exposure if it's a residential um, building. And that's prerequisite also. This is in the design phase now, not the construction. So the first credit is to do with enhancing indoor air quality strategies and that's to promote comfort, well-being and productivity in occupants by basically improving the indoor um, uh, air quality. So there's kind of three, depending on the type of system you have, well, first of all, there's two options. 
this slide just looks at option one first for strategies to enhance the indoor air quality for which you get one point so depending on which type of building you have whether it has mechanically ventilated naturally ventilated or a mixed mode system depends on which of these um, aspects you need to look at and some of them is combination so mechanically ventilated you need to look at entryway systems which basically means you need to install a permanent entryway system at least 10 feet long in the primary direction of travel and that's to capture dirt and particulates um, entering the building. B is interior cross contamination prevention and exhaust contaminated spaces. So basically you need to sufficiently exhaust and isolate a space where there might be any hazardous gases or chemicals being used and that might be due with like copy rooms, print rooms, laundries, anything like that. Um, the filtration, you need to have um, any ventilation system that's bringing outdoor air in to the occupied spaces needs to have filters on it for or air cleaning devices that will basically uh, meet particular ratings given, given in the manual. Then when you have a naturally ventilated space you have the same uh, entryway system requirement to meet. Uh, the natural ventilation design calculations is basically uh, guidance that's in the, that SIPC manual that um, gives guidance on how, to, on how to direct the airflow in naturally ventilated buildings. And then if you've got a mixed mode system, you're looking at the entryway system, you're looking at interior cross contamination, you're looking at filtration, you're also looking at the natural ventilation design calculations. So, so far that's a combination of the the other things above and then you also have this mixed mode um, design calculation to meet which basically um, has to demonstrate that the occupied spaces complies with a mixed mode the a SIBC manual in which specifies guidance for mixed mode systems so it's all about I suppose making sure that these systems comply with guidance available in standards and guidelines given as specified in the manual The second option, if you want to do additional strategies to get an additional one point under this credit category, then you need to, for each, depending on um, which mode you have, you need to select one of these options. Again, more detail on what exactly all of these options means is given in the manual. So for mechanically ventilated spaces, you need to pick one of these so that you're either um, decreasing the exterior contamination or you're increasing the ventilation and that needs to be a 30% um, increase above the minimum rates that are defined and determined in the prerequisite performance level. You need to um, ha have some additional source control and monitoring system that picks out other contaminants and monitors and source controls them at source. Where it's a naturally ventilated space you need to uh, have exterior contamination prevention again or have additional source control or monitoring or you can have natural ventilation room by room calculations so it's more detailed cal calculations from that SIBC guidance where it's mixed mode again the same types of things exterior contamination prevention increase the ventilation um, have additional source control or do the natural ventilation room by room calculations so you can kind of pick which of those you are going to do to get the additional credit. So as well as the first prerequisite credits two, three and four in this category are related to the construction phase so just pulling them out a little bit separately. Again, just to highlight, these are not things that should start in the construction phase so it's not things you only need to consider then but they're credits, excuse me, that um, you need to either gather evidence for or document or verify in the construction phase. So credit 2 looks at low emitting materials so that's to do with VOCs, volatile organic compounds um, that are harmful substances, substances that basically vaporize at room temperature so there's that those things that off gas um, so it could be adhesives or sealants or paints or furniture basically a lot of construction products would have VOCs within them so what you're trying to do here is limit the VOC concentrations and that's for the health of the occupants so it's also for the health and well-being of the construction personnel who are installing them as well um, so the first option to meet the requirements where you can get between one and three points is to comply with two or more of the five to seven categories and these are these categories are the paints the adhesives the flooring 
uh, the composite wood ceilings furniture. So if you have uh, basically products that fall within the standards for or the specification for low VOCs, low emitting materials in two or more of those categories, then you'll get the between one and three points. And it's just depending on um, the type of building and th it needs to meet the threshold levels essentially. So the, you have to use materials that don't exceed the threshold le level <laughs> levels that are given in the lead manual for each of those types of category of products. Um, and a certain requirements there as well. If you, if let's say you're some of the products within one of those categories, so let's say interior paints and coatings, like most of them are meeting it, but not all of them. So therefore you can't get the full category score, then you can use this option too, which is a budget calculation method. So you're looking at a percentage compliance um, using a using weighted av average. Um, so there's basically different points depending on the percentage of the total that you get, you get between one and three points as well. So this is uh, from the manual, but here you can see for each of those categories, the different thresholds and the different requirements that are needed in, all, in, all, in order to meet the category, um, to, to, to have the category included. And then again, depending on the number of compliant categories, it equates to the number of points that you can get for different types of um, buildings. And just remember, this is a construction phase one, so there's documentation required that might include the low emitting materials calculator. So some kind of online or manual calculator that shows um, that can demonstrate how you're meeting this. And you will also need product specific evidence. So documentation that has, you know, is third party verifications or testing or some kind of document that shows that it's meeting a low emitting materials spec. The third credit is about having a construction indoor air quality management plan for one point and that promotes not only the well-being of construction workers but also building occupants and this might apply if a building is going to be under construction during occupation. What you're trying to do is minimise the problems associated with that so it's dust, chemicals, any other particles in the air due, due to the construction. To meet the requirements, you have to develop and implement the plan during construction, the plan for construction and during pre-occupancy, you have to meet these MACNA control measures uh, and protect absorptive materials from moisture damage. That might be, absorptive materials might be if there is wood or timber products outside and it gets rained on and then they're brought in and then they're causing, the moisture within them is causing mould or mildew and that could lead to health issues. So it's about protecting those so that can't um, happen. That SMACNA is the Sheet Metal and Air Conditioning National Contractors Association. So there they have a set of guidelines um, with control measures in them. Um, you need to install Muraviat filters to the return air grill um, so, or the transfer duct in it. So opening for any equipment that would be operated during construction. So that's about filtering whatever the equipment that you're using. You have to install final filters immediately prior to occupation. Uh, prior to occupation, occupation was wrong with me today, <laughs> and you need to seal off basically the construction area. So you're protecting the ductwork, you're protecting the ventilation, um, uh, and sorry, you're ventilating the construction areas, and then you need to prohibit the use of tobacco inside the building and within 25 foot of the entrances during construction. The documentation, remember again, this is a construction phase. You need that management plan, the checklist. You need the protection me measures, plans. You need photos that show the measures in place, and you need to record the, 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 the. You have a record of the filtration media that you're using. So the fourth credit um, that's related to the construction phase is the actual assessment of the indoor air quality. And this is similar to the last one. It's looking at the quality of the indoor air, but now it's after construction and during occupancy. And you either, you can earn points by either doing a flush out of the building and you can do that before or during occupancy or by testing the air quality before occupancy. And basically you want to ensure that the air is safe to breathe. 
Um, so the first option then is to do that flush out and there's certain requirements. You have to use a certain amount of outdoor air per square foot, um, maintain temperatures uh, between 15 to 27 degrees C. You have to keep the relative humidity no higher than 60. And then once the flush out has reached 3,500, um, uh, cubic foot per square foot then you can people can occupy the space so once you know that it's been flushed out to a certain level uh, the second option then is to actually test the air and just test it for particular contaminants and make sure that the levels of those in the air are not exceeding maximum levels given in the manual so that's looking at the concentration of formaldehyde of particulates of vocs of chemicals carbon monoxide ozone particulates etc so all of those are detailed in the manual so that's two ways to meet that uh, and that's the last of the construction credits. Just to note that here, we're moving back into the design phase ones for this category. Um, just to note on the last one on the air quality, um, obviously the testing option will give you more points because it's more thorough than just flushing out the system. You can definitely prove that your air is safe, whereas the other one is just flushing out the building. The last set of credits under the IEQ category deal with um, the comfort of the building occupants. So it's looking about their thinking about their health, their welfare, their comfort, um, looking at thermal comfort, looking at daylighting, looking at access to controls, um, access to views, lighting, sound, um, basically overall satisfaction because there is a lot of, I suppose, research that shows, you know, if your occupants are healthy and have good well-being, then they tend to it, it, it'll reflect positively positively on the organisation in terms of sick days or lack of sick days and just general um, happiness of people who are using the, the building. So the first credit within this bunch then that look at that, credit number five, is on thermal comfort for which there's one uh, point. So in this we're looking at promoting the occupant's productivity, their comfort, their well-being by looking at providing a quality thermal comfort environment. The requirement here is to design um, a, a thermal comfort and an environment that stand that meets the ASHRAE 55-2010 standard, which is a very well-known and well-used thermal comfort standard. But there's also other options uh, if you don't want to meet that one. There's an ISO option and a CA standard for thermal comfort. And basically that sets the requirements that are needed to be met. So that first part is about the design. And then the second part is actually about the control. So that you need to provide controls for 50% of the individual occupants spaces and for all um, shared multi-occupant spaces. Is there needs to be the ability for the occupants to control the thermal comfort, um, you know, turn up the thermostat, turn down the sat, basically. So it's not just an automated system that there is some measure of control, individual and group control in those spaces. Um, the sixth credit is about interior lighting. This is about artificial lighting. Actually, the seventh one is about daylighting and it always strikes me as odd and I know it doesn't really mean anything, but that they put this one first because um, it should really be the other way around where you get the daylighting first and then you tackle what's left over with artificial. But again, that might just be very subliminal uh, and it goes back to the idea that these come from energy uh, perspectives essentially. So it's obviously it's talking about the energy stuff first. But anyway, that's a tangent. Um, again, this is looking at the same requirement about occupants. So it's their productivity, their comfort, their well-being, but this time by looking at high quality lighting. So there's two options. So you can get between one and two points. If you just do the first option, um, which is providing multi-scene lighting controls for at least 90% of occupant spaces. So that is where the individual would have at least three lighting levels to choose from that enable them to adjust the lighting to suit their individual tasks or their individual preferences. And that would be over at least 90% of those individual occupant spaces. Um, and the second option is to implement at least four additional strategies. And there is eight strategies given in the manual and you need to pick four of those and follow them through. And that goes through things to do with luminance levels, um, CRI levels, um, just basically a lot of formulae and, and thresholds of different types of 
artificial lighting strategies that you'd need to meet to get that um, second po second point to second uh, credit. Yeah. So the seventh credit, um, as I mentioned there, it is about daylight, natural daylight. And this again is the same thing about connecting um, occupants to the outdoors to reinforce circadian rhythms, uh, reduce the use of electrical lighting by introducing the daylight. The circadian rhythm is basically, I'm sure you've heard of it, but it's a daily cycle of biological activity um, on your internal clock. So and that's really influenced by your environment that you're in. Um, such as the difference between night and day, which is why when we all look at our phones at night, it kind of screws up our sleeping pattern, <laughs> or at least mine. Um, so if you have the proper amount of natural light, it can actually keep that circadian rhythm steady. So it's to do with that, the health and well-being, but it's also reduce, say, about reducing energy loads because obviously the more um, daylight requirements you can meet with natural light, the less reliance on artificial um, lighting and therefore energy you have. So you need to provide glare control for all regularly occupied spaces and you meet, meet one of these um, options. So either you do option one where you complete an annual daylight model and that looks at the spatial daylight autonomy for at least 55%. If that's if you do you'll get two points or if you look at 75% you'll get three points is achieved using the regularly occupied floor area. So that's, you know, you can't be using, you know, little store cupboards or whatever to, <laughs> or just areas that aren't used, or aren't generally occupied as part of that calculation. And you also have to look at the annual sunlight exposure, if no more than 10% is achieved. And there's a bit bit more detail in the manual. So either do that or you do a more detailed daylight model that looks at lux levels. So the first one is likely to be like daylight factor kind of stuff where you're looking at overall percentages and um, you're looking at an annual basis so it's not as detailed maybe. Um, and then you look at the daylight model and you look at it has to be between 300 and 3000 lux between 9am 9, 9 and 3pm for 75% of the floor area gets you one point or 90% of the floor area gets you two points. And then the third option is again, achieving that um, for 75% or 90%, uh, but it's a slightly different table and a slightly different formula and a slightly different calculation. So it's kind of using the same data, but in different ways, depending on the level of depth of inquiry you go into um, and the level of simulation and analysis you go into will dictate how many points you get out of this um, category. The eighth credit is again about the occupants is providing this connection to the outdoor environment by providing quality views. So there's this um, basically providing a direct line of sight to the outdoors. Um, to do that you need to uh, to meet the requirements, you need to provide that direct line of sight for 75% of the occupied, of the regularly occupied floor area, and you need to achieve at least two of the blow measures for the 75, again, for the 75%. So that's about multiple views, at least 90 degrees um, apart. So that's uh, multiple lines of sight uh, through vision glazing and different directions and those two different directions have to be 90 degrees apart. Um, you have to have views that include at least two of flora, fauna or sky or movement or distant objects um, and that they have to be at least 25 feet from the exterior of the glazing um, or you have to have an unobstructed view through vision glazing. Again that should be located within the distance of three times the head height of the vision glazing or views with a view factor of three or greater. So that's um, a standard of views. So you need to have at least a, a three rating or greater and that's standard, the reference standard is given in the manual. So you need to uh, include any interior obstructions in those calculations. So, you know, if there's a if it's an office building and you have got a permanent division that's up to, you know, 1100 metres high, it's like a blockwork wall dividing office areas, for example, uh, you need to include that. But if the furniture is movable, uh, they can be excluded. Um, 
and if it's a view into an interior atrium or interior space that does have some of those, it can only meet 30% of the required area and no more. Um, just occurred to me just to go a little bit further on this idea, again it's within the manual, but this idea of occupied and unoccupied spaces, so that those things are defined in LEED. So unoccupied spaces would tend to be things that are empty most of the time, uh, whereas occupied, and that might be like stairways or closets, things like that, whereas occupied spaces are intended to hold people most of the time. The occupied spaces are then further categorised, and we've come across it here, between regularly occupied and non-regularly occupied. So regularly occupied has got to do with the time frame as well, not only the kind of use of the space, but the time frame that um, how often people are in the space. Um, so uh, if it wasn't regularly occupied, it might be spaces that people pass through, um, like hallways or the store, you know, storage areas that they're going in and out of, copy rooms, locker rooms, stairways, etc. So they typically wouldn't spend more than an hour a day in it, for example. So it's not a regularly occupied space and it can't be included in the calculations. Um, so you could have um, an individually occupied, regularly <laughs> occupied space. So that would be um, a hotel room or an office or open office workstations. Whereas if it's a multi-occupant spaces, that might be something like an auditorium or a classroom or a hotel lobby, something like that, where there's got, you've got lots of occupants in the one space. Just to note that distinction and you'll find the definitions in the manual. The ninth and final credit under this category is about the acoustic performance of the spaces before which you can get uh, one point. This kind of um, developed in LEED, I mean it was rewritten in LEED because the way the daylighting aspect was structured meant that buildings, spe specifically I suppose office buildings were being configured in a very different way to kind of increase the daylighting level. So private offices were kind of gone and it was about open plan officing, it was about offices, it was about lowered panel heights um, and then you had maybe private offices encasing glass in the centre of the floor, you had uh, more glass. So in fact the acoustics in many of these buildings were actually worse than they might have been previously before. Uh, there were people who were trying to apply lead to them. So that meant that this acoustic performance is was rewritten and the intent of it was to actually promote effective uh, acoustic design, again looking at occupants' well-being and productivity and communication. There are um, several strategies that are just within this that you need to achieve um, for all occupied spaces. So that's coming back to the definition I was just talking about. So it's for the occupied spaces that need to meet the requirements that are given in the lead manual in relation to the HVAC background noise. So basically you're trying to specify their um, background now, no, putting restrictions on background noise levels that are produced by HVAC systems. Um, the sound isolation or transmission, so you're using, um, you're using products that have particular sound transmission classes um, or the building regulation or um, building regulation codes, whichever is the more stringent. Um, then there's certain criteria around reverberation times. Um, so there is particular levels and reverberation times that you need to meet depending on the type of room and how the room is being used. Then again, there is a criteria given when it comes to sound reinforcement and masking then. So the sound reinforcement is basically the, the loops um, that are available um, and you need to evaluate whether they're needed or not. And then if they are needed, there's certain criteria that those systems um, need to meet, minimum criteria. And then if you need masking systems, so if you need something that, um, if there's any kind of frequencies of speech that need to be masked or hidden or if volumes of sound that need to be masked or hidden, then there's criteria to do with that as well um, and decibel levels that can't be exceeded. So it's very technical, I suppose, credit. Um, and like many of the quite technical ones, all of the, the devil is in the details and all of the details are in the manual. So um, this is definitely one of those ones. 
And that is concludes the lecture eight on indoor environmental quality. Thank you.